you don't just go and hire a property manager and say, okay, there you go, go for it. You have to make sure that the property manager is following your business plan, doing things as efficiently as possible, not taking the easy way out, you know, making sure they stick to the budget. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services for real estate investors and rental property owners. With your host, Brian Hamlet, from Hamlet Investment Group. This episode is about the property owner, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 270. My guest today spent 20 years working as a teacher, nine years working for various government agencies, and 17 years in information technology, but he left all that behind when he began investing in real estate. Jeff Greenberg is now an experienced syndicator with over 12 years of experience in commercial real estate. He currently controls over 1,000 units with a value over $40 million, including 300 student housing beds. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. So why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started investing in real estate? Well, if we go back that far, um, it just so happened a friend of mine were taking a walk and uh, he mentioned he was getting into real estate. And uh, at that time, I thought real estate meant buying a single family home and renting it out. Um, but further research, I found that there was many ways to get into real estate. Now, this was around in 2008 and I started looking at uh, bank owned properties. And the problem was the bank didn't really know how to get rid of these properties. They had so many foreclosed properties that they couldn't, they were unequipped uh, to, to get rid of them. So it was very difficult. Also prices were dropping so fast when we made an offer on a property. Uh, the, the, by the time the bank responded, the price had dropped drastically. So it just wasn't working. And I met someone that was involved with multifamily properties. This was about in 2007 and, uh, just kind of went from there, learned, uh, how to buy commercial properties, how to, um, invest with other people and, uh, it, just went on from there. So you started around 2007, 2008. Were these single family homes that you were looking at originally? Originally, they were single family homes. They were foreclosed bank owned uh, properties that we were looking at. What was the logic that made you say, you know what, uh, single families are okay, but I'd like to get into multifamily and apartments? I was in the middle of a divorce at that time with uh, limited funds. And there were certain amount of properties I would have been able to buy by myself. But I was in my 50s already, and I knew that this was going to take way too long, and I needed something that would accelerate uh, my growth and the buildup of my equity, um, and I saw multifamily as the avenue to do that. You know, it's interesting. I wonder if we crossed paths back then because I was also getting into multifamily and learning how to syndicate between 2008, 2012. Where did you go to get your education? Because there, there's a lot of choices today, but even back then in 2008, there weren't nearly as many educational sources. Well, I was involved with uh, Dave Lindahl and the RE Mentor Program. Oh, that's what I thought because um, that's where I got my information. Too. Yeah, that was... Uh, that was quite a, a while ago because you're right. There are a lot of people doing it. And a lot of people came from his programs too. I see a lot of people that are putting on seminars that uh, were involved with uh, Dave's programs back then as well. Take us through your first deal. I mean, what steps did you actually take to purchase multifamily? I had met a partner um, through the program. We had uh, you know, heard each other on different uh, or seen each other in different events and whatever. And we got together and uh, we bought a 20-unit property. Uh, this was the first real estate outside of my own personal home that I had ever purchased, but it was a 20-unit property, and we syndicated it. 
and um, it was built. I believe that property was built in 2007, and we bought it in uh, 2010. So it was a three-year-old property. We thought, okay, this is a home run. And we found that uh, there was a lot of issues involved with getting a very small property through a syndication in a very slow growth market. Um, it was also 100% occupied. They were already paying their electric and there were really no upsides. There was, there was no value adds. We had thought we would be able to raise rents and that was a very difficult process. We tried to build back water because electricity was already being paid. That was a very difficult process in that market. And the biggest issue was, was increasing the value of the property. So it was, you know, as, as, as Rod says, it was a seminar. Did you buy it in distress? Did you buy it as a short sale or for closure at the time? No, no, it was not. Well, the only distress was it was, it was currently owned. It was actually, be, uh, let me clarify, it was five fourplexes. So, but it was being, we were going to treat it as a 20 unit apartment. It was all in the same cul-de-sac. So there was two different developers and the developers were in distress that they weren't able to sell it in 2007 when they built them, that they were, they became the managers and they were lousy managers. They didn't want to be managers. And that was, that was the main distress on it. Um, the properties were 100% occupied. As I said, they were almost new properties. So there wasn't any distress that way. Um, they were in the market uh, is Harlingen, Harlingen, Texas, if you're familiar with that. It's between McAllen and Brownsville, Texas, along the Texas-Mexico border. Um, and it was very much a slow growth community. But we felt that there was issues. First of all, it was near McAllen, which was a great market, which I really wanted to get into. We felt this was a, a, a doorway into getting into the McAllen market. But also uh, Bass Pro Shop was just uh, getting ready to break ground in this huge property. We thought, okay, they're going to be a big draw. Uh, all of these other companies are going to come in and this market is going to start to blossom. Uh, there was a nearby market um, just a couple miles away that had um, one of these outlet malls, premium outlet malls. And because the premium outlet mall was there, that community was really uh, moving along very well. And we thought that this Bass Pro Shop would, would be do similar, where it would bring in businesses and this market would grow. And we were wrong. It was just very slow uh, progression and very difficult to raise rents. And we didn't have anything else to go on because there was, you know, it was 100% occupied. We were well occupied. Were there operational efficiencies you were able to bring to maybe increase your net operating income? Not much, not much. Um, we did have some difficulty with property management. Um, you know, as most people know, when you're dealing with these smaller properties, um, it's difficult to get good management companies. So we did go through three different management and it was a, a, a lady uh, that she was a broker out of Brownsville. She managed it and her husband did the, the repairs. So our expenses weren't high. They were able to keep our expenses down. They did a nice job on, on running the property. There just wasn't a lot of meat on the bone and so the investors got their returns. We had a pref return. So the investors got their return, but we weren't making any money. And we actually had to hold it another year. We were supposed to hold it five. We ended up holding it six years just because we drew a line in the sand saying, this is what we're going to sell it for. And we're going to hold it until we do. And that way we got the investors a little bit more money. We made a, a tiny bit of money. But we, we had a six-year seminar. Yeah, I would guess that if your, your investors were getting paid their pref, there probably wasn't much left over for you and your, your um, general partners to make your Absolutely. profit. So mm -hmm. was this a case where you really didn't get paid till you sold the property? Right. 
And what we got paid wasn't very much. Talk about it from your first syndication standpoint, though. How much did you raise and how did you go about raising that money? Well, this was a, a small raise. Well, for us at the time, it was a huge raise. Um, it was $350,000. And uh, my partner got it mostly from um, business acquaintances, ex-bosses, friends. Um, I didn't get any of that. All of the money that I raised was from people that I had met through real estate after I got into the business. So nobody from my previous life uh, invested in that deal. It was all people that I had met going to different events. That's interesting. Why is it that no one from your previous life, because you've been in education, government, um, uh, some other businesses, why is it that none of them were willing to come along with you on, on that? That's a good question, but I don't think most of them had any money. They really didn't have you know, the funds to invest. And seeing me in a different light from where they saw me before was, was a totally different thing. So I'm not sure. Um, but it's interesting that, that we just pulled from totally different groups of people. What did you bring to the table in that situation? Because it's not like you had great wealth that you could just deploy into buying these apartments. Well, the two of us were in the same place. And this is probably something that I would tell people not to do is, is just partner up with someone that's basically, a, you know, you're both beginners and you're um, both kind of fumbling around. We were going through the same training. Um, and, you know, she was a great person. I learned a, a heck of a lot from her. I have total, total respect for her. Um, but both of us were kind of learning at the same time. Now, what got us into this deal was, was one, we established or I established a relationship with the local broker uh, who was a displaced Californian. He was now living in Texas, and so he was the one that brought the deal. But he introduced me to a bank that desperately wanted to get those owners out of the deal. Uh, these were the developers, as I said. The bank was not happy with them. They were behind on their taxes. They, the bank met us. I mean, it was a two-branch bank. It's a tiny bank. They met us. They liked us. And they were doing everything that they could to get us in the deal and, and get us, get them out. In fact, one of the, um, one of the owners, um, he was going to have to come, he was going to have to come in with money to, to close the deal. And um, my broker put in part of his commission to get that piece done. The other one, um, they wanted the loan amount to be lower. This wasn't supposed to be an assumption. They wanted to reduce the loan amount. We said, well, we can't come in with any more money. This is all we can come in with. Otherwise, our numbers don't work. And what they ended up doing is they actually negotiated with one of the sellers to give us a second. And so the owner, the seller carried a second for us which we didn't pay off until the end, until the closing or until we uh, sold it. But that's how much the bank wanted us in there. So it was that relationship with the with the broker and then, then with the bank that got us into that deal. And being that this was your first deal, like of this size, uh, how did you establish that broker and bank relationship? Well, the broker was more of a friendship thing where we talked about California. He grew up in the Northern California, we talked about that. I went down and met him and his family and we would go running around. This wasn't the first property we had looked at. We had been trying for about two years uh, to get a property together. And so we had looked at lots of properties while we were down there. Um, I started, every time I went down there, I started staying at his house. He invited me into his house and I you know, met his wife and family. So that relationship, the relationship that he had with the bank is what helped us out because he had helped the bank out with a foreclosure they were trying to get rid of. He um, helped them with that. And so he introduced us to the bank and all that relationship helped out quite a bit. But the other thing is, is when we met with them, uh, we told them about our experience and most of it was 
uh, seminar type of education. We told them what we were doing to educate ourselves, that we were in some deals as passive investors. And we were very impressed, or excuse me, they were very impressed with us, um, what we were trying to do and felt we really wanted in this deal. And so they were doing everything they could to get us in that deal. That's great. That's great. You got them impressed with you and your, and your partner. Uh, when a lot of lenders look at the track record, what have you done in mm -hmm. the past? But you were able to really shift that emphasis to just how much they liked you and wanted to work with you. Mm -hmm. And our, our, our education, how we were educating ourselves. And, you know, I mean, it wasn't a huge property, but, um, you know, we obviously impressed the, uh, the, the bank and they wanted us in. I'd imagine your, your investors were getting paid along the way. They were getting their press. Were they happy when you sold? They were happy. Most of them, most of them stuck with us on uh, to future deals. They also saw what dedication we put into it, you know, and realizing that we weren't getting paid for six years of our time. And uh, they looked at our integrity and, you know, um, our stick to it -iveness. And uh, so they were happy with us. Then let's talk about the next syndication. How long did it take you to find another property and go through the syndication process again? Well, that one we went into, I believe it was 2013. So it was uh, still another, well, not, it was the end of 2010 when we got this first one. So it was, it was less, than, uh, less than three years that we got into the next one. Um, so part of the, let me back up just a little bit. Part of the issue was we were looking for this pie in the sky deal that really wasn't happening. Um, you know, we were looking at eight and a half caps. Um, we were looking at a 12% cash on cash return. Uh, I think you know where that came from. Um, and that we were having a real difficult time finding. And so because of that, we weren't getting into deals. We had made lots of offers. We'd made lots, lots of offers and got beat out on a lot of deals. And then finally we got into this one that was in Houston. And the funny part is, again, this was a relationship. This was the same relationship. That same broker brought this Houston deal. He was starting to try to establish himself in Houston, and he had gone on cold calls. He had been going from uh, from apartment complex to apartment complex, and he found uh, the owner at this one apartment complex, which was 150 units, and asked if they wanted to sell it. And they said no. But they said, wait, well, we have this other one that maybe we'll sell you. And so that's when they went over to this 62-unit uh, property that he had bought out of foreclosure. And he said, look, I'll sell you this one. And my broker negotiated, he went, negotiated the price down a couple hundred thousand from what he was first interested in. And as soon as he got a price that he liked, I was the first one he called. And that was the key. He, because he could have called a whole bunch of other people. He could have called people that could have come in with cash. He could have called people that could have closed faster than us, but he called me. And I still think he was crazy to do that, but he did. And because of that, we got into a fantastic deal. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. 
If you are thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at RCB Associates LLC.com. Why was this a fantastic deal? What, what can you tell us about that? Well, it was, as I said, 62 units. The owner originally two years earlier had bought it for 600000 this is near Hobby Airport um, in Houston. Um, we paid 1.3 for it. It was 85% occupied. Um, there was no rubs on it. Um, and the cap rate, originally when we calculated it, the cap rate was an 11. Now, the reason we didn't close at 11 because the insurance came in real high. <laughs> We, the insurance originally came in at $1,100 a door, okay? So that dropped our cap rate from an 11 to about a nine and a half, which still nine and a half is a fabulous cap rate. Why so high on the insurance? Because one and a half feet of the building, no, excuse me, a corner of the building was a foot and a half below flood zone, okay, or in a flood zone. So the entire building had to be considered in a flood zone. And we, shortly after closing, within about six months, we got it down to about 800 a door, which still isn't great, but it was a lot better than 1,100 a door. Um, but yeah, because it was in a flood zone. And the funny part was, is the first flood that came through Houston didn't touch the property. It flooded other areas that were not in flood zones, but it didn't touch our property. I, I have a similar property where a corner of one of the buildings is in a flood zone A, which is a hundred year flood. flood yeah, thing. yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it costs us an extra fifteen thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. and of course, that's the one area that never floods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have flooding issues at several other buildings, but uh, the one we pay the flood insurance on is, is mm -hmm. the one that will never flood. Well, the funny thing is, is when we sold it in two thousand sixteen. Uh, Three months later, it did flood, but that was three months after we had we had sold it. So it, it finally it finally flooded, but that was after we got rid of it. Well, good thing they had insurance then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because then he was uh, about six months after that. This guy was trying to sell it for uh, about a million a million four more than what he paid us for. Wow! You know, within six months. So, well, the problem thing was, is he probably redid the entire bottom layer. Mm -hmm. So you've talking 31 units plus the office that was flooded would have been totally redone. So that, you know, probably could have gotten him that value. Yeah. So he got lucky with the flood because it allowed him to add a lot of value to that property. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what he got on the insurance, but as long as he was well covered, um, that would have added the value. But we, we sold it. We bought it for one three in 2016. We sold it uh, in 2016, so three years later, for 2.7. So, because we bought it undervalued, and um, the cap rate helped us out. The cap rate uh, compressed down. We added value to it by increasing the rents, increasing the occupancy, um, and and uh, implementing the rubs, and then sold it for quite a bit more. Our, our investors did very well on that one. Yeah, from a syndication standpoint, how much did you have to raise uh, from investors? What, what were the projections that you, you made and then how did you beat those projections? Mm -hmm. That one was a $700,000 raise. Uh, it was a one, I think that was the 1.3 million purchase. So we raised, we raised 700,000. And the projections were a five-year hold. Uh, we were looking at about an IRR is about 21% on a five-year hold. 
and we gave a 40 percent annualized return, a hundred and twenty percent return in three years. So we kind of went over our projections. That's great. That's and great. The, and the investors weren't unhappy about that. No, I can imagine a forty percent return each year is uh, fantastic. So you mentioned rubs, and I want to make sure our listeners understand what that is. Yeah, that's one way that you added value to the property by in, in, instituting a rubs program. What is that? That's a, a residential utility build back program, where basically you're billing, uh, in some manner, uh, back the utilities, uh, typically water, electric, uh, if they have gas, which usually. Uh, usually they don't, but it's usually water and electric that you're billing back to the uh, tenant. Sometimes you're billing back trash as well. How, how do you go about instituting a program like that? Well, that one was pretty much with the property manager. She had uh, formulas that she was using, um, calculating how much uh, each unit uh, would be charged. And typically on the um, the, the water, it's usually... Uh, the, I don't know if she used the number of tenants uh, in each unit to calculate it. Um, you know, you, you can't charge beyond, you can't make a profit on utilities. You, could, you have to charge under what your utility bill, bills are. Uh, you can't charge them for common areas. So they, you could use a third party company that will figure it out. Or if you've got calculations, that usually you're going to get 75 to 80, maybe 85 percent of your water and electric uh, expenses back. Yeah, it's a great way to increase your net operating income by decreasing your expenses because you're getting that utility expense reimbursed. What I also like about the RUBS program is it gives people an incentive to be more conservative. A lot of times people will, you know, leave their air conditioning running full blast while they're gone or run their air conditioner and, and open windows. But if they realize that it's going to affect their bill or, or everybody's bill in the building, um, they're more likely to to be more conservative. Same with the water. Uh, if you've got a running toilet, you know, they'll be more likely to notify you if, if they know that that could affect their water bill. So it does incentivize people to be more environmentally aware. So how many syndications have you done and how much money have you raised over this period? I've done uh, seven syndications, not a, not a heck of a lot. And I've raised uh, over, I think I've raised, raised over about $7 million of equity for my investors. Primarily in Texas or where, where all are you investing? I've had three in Texas. I still own one right now, which actually is on the market. Um, but I've also got some student housing in Georgia, Arizona, and Ohio. Now, how active are you in those deals from the general partner side? It depends on the deal. Um, on the, the the Texas one, the one that's in Amarillo, uh, I'm very active as far as overseeing the asset manager. Uh, the ac- asset manager is actually on our GP team. And so we meet all the time on that one. Um, on my Georgia deal and my Ohio one, I'm actually the asset manager. On my Arizona, uh, one of my other uh, GP partners uh, is the asset manager and we meet all the time on that. So it varies in uh, stages on the different properties. And what are your functions as the asset manager? So for our listeners who may not really know what that means, or understand what all the duties are when it comes to asset managing, what all do you do? Essentially, the asset manager is a representative of the, the syndication uh, of the, the, uh, the, the deal sponsor or the deal owner um, working with the property manager. It's, you don't just go and hire a property manager and say, okay, there you go, go, go for it. Um, you have to make sure that the property manager is following your business plan uh, doing things as efficiently as possible, not taking the easy way out, um, uh, you know, with vendors, you know, a lot of times they'll just go pick the first vendor, you know, it doesn't matter if this one happens to be a more expensive vendor than another one, because it's not, you know, it's, it's not costing them, it's costing the property. Um, you know, making sure they stick to the budget, 
that they establish a budget and uh, that they go by that budget, and as well as, as I said, your your business plan. So it's basically you're represent, representing the ownership and the asset manager is the one that's doing that. Are you the one also who is communicating with the investors and letting them know how the investment is doing? Yeah, that's pretty much me on on all of the deals, except for the one Houston deal that we just got in. Actually, uh, I got in a one uh, just, I believe, in September. And that one, I'm more of playing a, a, a smaller role. I do, um, I am communicating with uh, the investors, but not doing as much in the way of uh asset manager, uh, asset management, much smaller role in that one. What's your style when it comes to communicating with investors? Uh, how do you like to do it? Is it quarterly, monthly, and what kind of information do you share with them? We uh, try to, uh, we put on a, a, a newsletter, a little blurb uh, every month just to let uh, investors know what's going on. And then at the end of every quarter, we have a quarterly conference call, which we record and uh, send out financials. So um, they can join the, the call and go over the financials or they can get it, they'll get it sent to them uh, if they're unable to attend or they want to listen to it again. But mainly uh, through that communication, uh, I also correspond anytime an investor has questions. Uh, I try to get back to them uh, within 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours to communicate with them. I think it's important that we respect our investors. Uh, They're a big part of these deals and it's important that we make them uh, feel comfortable in our deals. Where are you now in in your investing? Are you still um, looking for apartments to syndicate and and using the same model that you've been using for the past 10 years or are you looking at something new? Yeah, well, that's a great segue into what I'm doing right now as far as, um, as, as we discussed, I've been uh, the main uh, GP in all of my deals for the last uh, 12 years. And I, I've also been the main fundraiser. So now what I'm doing is using a lot of the knowledge that I've had uh, over those past years to, to uh, vet good deal sponsors, high quality deal sponsors with uh, great track records and to help investors get into those deals. And so I'm essentially raising equity, working with investors and bringing it into uh, other people's deals. And how do you go about that? Because I know that there are certain rules and things you can and can't do when you're raising money for other people's deals. There's a lot of lot of different pieces um, and it's going to depend if it's a what's called a 506C or a 506B deal as far as uh, working with investors. Um, but I think what you're asking about is participating in a deal. How do I do that and stay within the SEC guidelines? And there's there's uh, three ways that we look at doing, uh, getting involved with other people's deals. Um, if I come in as a part of the GP team, okay, I have to uh, have other responsibilities uh, along with the GPs, other than just bringing in funds, you can't just go and say, "Okay, I'm going to bring in, you know, uh, five hundred thousand dollars, and I want X amount uh, percentage of ownership, and that's all I'm going to do." Uh, there needs to be other responsibilities and participation in uh, different activities within the the GP. Uh, it is gray as far as exactly what that means through the SEC. SEC has a great way of doing things um, with, instead of saying what you can't do, they, if you're doing something right, they'll say, okay, that's okay. It's not like, okay, you've got to do these things. So it's, it's a very gray area where, where we've got to figure out exactly what you can do and what can't do. The SEC doesn't help us a lot with making it black and white. So you've got a lot of different interpretations. But the main thing is, is you if you're going to bring money into somebody else's deal uh, and you're going to be part of the GP team, you need to have other responsibilities other than just investor relationships. And you can't be compensated uh, by either money or GP shares directly related to the amount of money that you bring in. 
that's considered transactional. So those the main rules on that. But other ways of getting into deals is if we're looking at bringing in funds uh, to deals by bringing in an entity, forming our own entity and investing that entity in somebody else's deal. And then by bringing in a lot of money into a deal, we're looking at uh, deal sponsors that will give us better terms, maybe a better preferred rate, uh, maybe a better split at the end. And that way we could make uh, the, the funds, we could make the delta, the difference, you know, uh, for bringing those people in. You know, if I bring a couple million in rather than 50,000 apiece, uh, it makes it a lot easier for a deal sponsor. The other thing that we're doing is uh, we're working on a fund where we will create a fund where I'll have uh, uh, funds available to invest in different deals and that fund would invest in uh, other people's deals uh, rather than just a single purpose entity coming into a deal. So we're looking at all those different avenues. Yeah, and you and I had talked about that about a month ago about structuring a fund. Um, mm -hmm. Have you have you figured out uh, how, what that fund is going to look like? Oh, I'm getting closer to it, but I'm still I'm still not there yet. I'm I'm working with a group of people that have done a lot of funds, and we're we're just going to be working out some of the details. But I haven't quite gotten that yet. By the way, I'll just mention this right now because I had this conversation uh, with you and several other people. So I put together a white paper that uh, by the time this comes out will be available on my website. So if someone out there is trying to figure out how to structure their fund, uh, I'm not an attorney, you're not an attorney, but we've talked to enough people. Um, we're kind of going through that process ourselves. I put out a white paper that has some, some things to consider. Uh, including a, an Excel spreadsheet about how to uh, make sure that people who come in later aren't overcompensated compared to people who come in early. So you can go to my website, uh, higinvestor.com, uh, to get that download that white paper. No, but I actually uh, I, I liked that, and and I and I plan on using that uh, that concept of people coming in at different points in time. Because one of the problems you have with a fund is if it's an open-ended fund, you have people who come in early and are getting their preferred return you know, right away or as soon as uh, possible. But then the people who come in late or later are, are still getting that preferred return. But when it comes time to liquidate the fund and pay out the profits, you need to make sure that it's balanced between, uh, you know, for how long people have been in the fund. And what I've done is come up with a weighted uh, value that's based on the number of days they're in the fund and the number of units or shares they purchase in that fund. Some funds I'm seeing just kind of ignore that piece as far as, you know, the, the time period someone comes in. What uh, asset classes will you be going after with your fund or your, your fundraising? Is it still apartments and multifamily? Is that where your your interests are or are you looking at other asset classes? That's where I'm going to pretty much start because that's where my comfort level is. But if I don't have a problem going out and finding um, good deal sponsors, in some other asset classes, such as self-storage and uh, mobile home parks, but I would I would team up with someone that has expertise in those areas because that's not my my field of expertise. Uh, but certainly, I would still vet them and and you know uh, ensure that they're a high quality deal sponsor. But I would rely more on their expertise on a particular deal. What is your outlook right now, Jeff, on the multifamily and apartment sector? I mean, we're, we're recording this late January 2021. Uh, there's obviously the pandemic going on. Do you have a, a, a positive outlook on multifamily and apartments or do you um, look at it differently now? I do have a positive outlook. I do feel that uh, we're going to continue. Uh, I mean, the, the population is continuing to grow. Uh, I, I think that home ownership is, you know, a, an elusive uh, uh, object for a lot of people. You know, the, you know, they say people need a place to live. You, you need to find the proper markets, the um, markets that are bringing in jobs, that are bringing in populations. Uh, 
you know, so definitely I think it's a great market to be in. Um, the student housing one is one that I have a little hesitancy to. An office space, you know, some of those things are in question. You know, retail, some of those are in question. You know, there's a lot of other areas of commercial real estate that I would be a lot more hesitant uh, on, especially since, you know, this the pandemic. Yeah, well, as someone who's who's invested in student housing, what what is your concern in that niche? Well, the concern is a lot of schools are finding out they can do a lot of things online, that they're doing a lot of, I know a lot of universities that are almost doing all online classes. Some of them are doing everything online that they, they uh, can't, uh, that they can possibly do. Um, obviously, there's certain things that you can't do online. There's lab classes and things that, that you need to come into campus, but that may change the outlook for a lot of the student housing um, businesses. And from the three student housing properties I have, I've got three totally different reactions. Um, I've got a property in uh, Oxford, Ohio, up near Miami University. And Miami University decided that they weren't going to require their um, sophomores to live on campus. And all of a sudden, my property manager got 50, 50 emails within an hour. And we're filled at 100% at higher rents than we've had since our ownership. So that was a great, that was a great move. Um, my other property down in Georgia, which is a much more lower economic area, um, you know, they're hurting more. Um, our, our occupancy was about... 90, we're about 98%. Now we're about 85%. Some of the kids are, uh, the students are either skipping semesters or, you know, waiting, waiting it out kind of thing. You know, uh, I hear this, there's schools in California that say it's 100% online. You know, how's that going to affect, you know, the student housing? People can save money, stay at home and sit at their computer at home. So, I've got a more wait and see attitude on the student housing right now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a student housing unless it was extremely uh, 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 low in price, that it was a, a fabulous value. Um, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of the kids that are, that are uh, doing the online, the online classes, but they're doing it out of our units. You know, as long as our Wi-Fi is good, you know, they would rather be out of their house but if the parents are paying for it, why would the parents want to pay for it if they could, you know, do it in their basement, you know, or something? So yeah. I, I'm real, I'm real cautious on student housing right now. Hey Jeff, how would people get a hold of you or find out more about you? You can go to my website, which is Synergetic IG. Uh, so you go www.synergeticig.com. Or you can write me at jeff at synergeticig.com. Uh, and uh, glad to talk to people. And as we wrap it up, do you have any uh, parting advice for our listeners who might be thinking of syndicating, raising money from investors? Uh, what would you say to them? Find someone with that's experienced and see how you can help them out. See how you can partner with them. See how you can learn from them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the one of the initial mistakes that I felt that we made in our, in our career was two of us newbies getting together. And even though we were, we had mentoring and we did go to seminars, we still were, were fumbling around together in the dark. And uh, I think being a partner, helping out someone more experienced and learning from them and don't even think about what you're going to be making as far as off of the first deal you work with them or the second deal you work with them. That doesn't matter. The education that you're going to get from partnering with somebody and learning from a, a more experienced per person is more value than you can imagine. And that, that would be my parting advice. Yeah, like you said, your first syndication, you really didn't make much money at all, no. uh, especially during the hold period. But I'm sure the education was invaluable. Yep, absolutely. And if we would have had someone with more experience, we we probably wouldn't gotten have gotten into that deal in the first place. But you know, it what 
it was what it was. We didn't lose anybody's money, and uh, all we lost was a lot of time. But you know that was experience. But you got your foot in the door and you got started, and that's that's absolutely most. So, well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, This has been a great conversation and I appreciate you sharing uh, your syndication experience with us and kind of taking us through that first syndication project uh, as well as the second and uh, where you are now with with, uh, raising money possibly as a fund and the type of asset classes that that you're looking at or not looking at as, as the case may be. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find